hit record here. Okay, so um, where were we up to? Well, we were talking about uh, static electricity and uh, in particular, we were talking about how uh, induced charges work. So in this uh, picture with the lady with the laundry stuck to her, um, stuck to her, sticks to her rather, because basically the charges rearrange themselves um, and they rearrange themselves in such a way such as to uh, have like the opposite charges come closer to the charged object. So in this case, this sock, and then the like charges sort of go away. And then basically the combination of these things eventually results in a attraction because these positive charges are closer to the negative charges. So uh, this is also the reason why uh, we had, uh, you know, um, if you remember the ladies with the hair standing on their ends, uh, standing outside, taking a picture. So this was also an effect of induced charges. Um, and we also explored how sort of sparks can form. So this is if you uh, uh, charge yourself up in winter and have you know uh, a lot of static on you, then if you go and touch something, if your charges are big enough, actually a spark can actually actually form. Normally you don't feel it. Uh, sorry, no, you don't see it. You definitely feel it, but. Um, uh the you know sometimes you know if the charges are very big you can actually see it too so uh how do we understand this well we understand this from the point of view of uh voltage and um so voltage is basically a measure of how much energy each charge has and it's actually a kind of potential energy because the electricity can be well potentially used for something Right, so the uh, the charges are storing energy, and they can actually be used uh, to to maybe power your appliance or something like this. So um, it's measured in uh, joules per coulomb. So coulomb is the measure of how much charge you have. Energy is of course measured in joules, and so well in this spark example, basically the electrons that, that, that you have on your hand are very um, high voltage. They have a, like a lot of energy and they're trying to all get towards somewhere with the much lower energy. Okay, so uh, one of the questions we had earlier on is like why this isn't dangerous. I told you that the voltage can be like thousands of volts. So why isn't it actually dangerous? Well, it's basically because the amount of current is actually pretty small. So we actually calculated uh, the power, which is like, so um, in this case, the energy per unit time. And basically, okay, so I think the numbers we got was something like, you know, this was 0.1 watts and this is 0 0.01 watts. And um, this is certainly bigger than that, but I mean, okay, it's same ballpark, you know. Not, not so different. So we know very well that, you know, a 1.5 volt battery isn't gonna be very dangerous. And essentially the spark is maybe only a little bit bigger than that. So it's like about six times bigger, but um, still still pretty small. Um, uh, we also talked a little bit about insulators. Uh, why are things, you know, what happens when you have an insulator? Uh, and basically the picture that we have is that you when you when you have an electric field, um, this actually polarizes the atoms, so they get kind of stretched out. And um, in this state, it's still an insulator. It's just that you know part of the atom is sort of going uh, towards one end, and the other part is going to the other end. It's still an insulator. But what can happen is that this can totally break apart, and um, the electron and the uh, other part the ionized atom can sort of go in opposite directions and once this sort of starts happening it just actually all these particles bump into each other and then um, actually it's uh, what used to be an insulating gap here now becomes actually a pretty uh, conductive medium so uh, electrical breakdown 
actually changes the nature of the material. It actually makes this, um, you know, uh, conductive to some extent. So uh, basically because it's sort of a self-sustaining process, you know, uh, maybe you can picture it sort of like, you know, the, the normal state is not insulating, but then once it's uh, sort of kind of rolling along this kind of uh, electrical breakdown, then it just sort of keeps on uh, sustain it, sustaining itself so that it's, uh, it, it remains in this conductive state. Um, Van de Graaff generator is basically just a machine to you know, generate static electricity. And you might've seen that in demos and uh, I think we went through this and uh, gave our explanations um, given this uh, kind of background. Okay, so that's sort of recap. We didn't really strictly need this uh, for today's lecture, but um, but actually the stuff with the electrical breakdown might come into it. So I thought uh, we just might recap that. Okay, so um, uh, as I said at the beginning, um, I kind of wanted to make this course sort of a uh, goal-oriented course. So instead of just sort of learning kind of random facts about you know nature and things like this it's i thought it's better to sort of um sort of think of it more like we're trying to understand how some thing works right and so basically the one of the main things that we want to try and understand in this chapter is how our photocopy machine works uh it sounds a little bit dull but actually it's a pretty ingenious piece of technology right um you know, I mean, before photocopy machines, imagine the amount of work you had to do to like copy things, um, you know, had to be done manually, right? And so uh, it's really one of the kind of major inventions really of, of the modern age. Um, you sort of take it for granted, but um, actually it's uh, hugely important, of course. Um, so, but, you know, how does it actually work? And um, in fact, actually, once we understand how a photocopy machine works, we can actually also understand how a laser printer works. And of course, you know, that's uh, yet another very super useful type of um, uh, invention. So uh, we're going to try and sort of really understand um, what some of these things, uh, some of these questions are like, you know, so when you do photocopy, you see this bright band going across and um, obviously it's kind of scanning the document, but I mean, exactly what, what is that? What is that like? You know, where is that like going? What is it going to be doing? Uh, uh, what is actually this toner stuff that you have to put in photocopy machine? You know that you need it for the printing, but you know, actually what is it? And, um, and in a laser printer, well, in the name so apparently a laser printer has a laser in it but you know what what does a laser do is it like burning burning holes in the paper or you know something like this you know is it blackening the paper making the print print out or something um you know how, how does that actually work so uh we're going to try and understand that stuff so um uh just a bit of a history lesson i guess first so uh, photocopy machine was invented by this guy called Chester Carlson. It's an American guy who went to Caltech, uh, graduated in 1930. And um, actually with a lot of these people um, that invent various things, uh, they often do a degree in physics. So, you know, not, not trying to push physics in, in some way, but actually there's a, you know, a very interesting sort of, uh, you know, group of people, very, very famous people like, um, uh, well, you know, like Elon Musk, I think, uh, did a physics degree, dropped out. Um, you might have heard of the WikiLeaks guy, um, Julian Assange. Uh, he's an Australian guy. Uh, one of my friends actually was, um, he came in as a mature age student to, I think, uh, Melbourne University. And then so one of my colleagues was actually teaching him as a mature age student. And he also did a physics degree. I think Angela Merkel also did uh, some, some kind of physics somewhere. So, you know, I mean, it's kind of interesting to see uh, what people end up doing with uh, physics degrees. Um, somehow, uh, well, 
I mean, obviously it's related to a lot of technology and physics underlies a lot of that technology, but, um, um, but often you see people um, in strange, strange places uh, with, with a physics degree. So, um, so he worked in Bell Labs as a research engineer uh, and then as a patent attorney assistant. Um, so uh, patent attorney is, uh, you know, basically a lawyer, but uh, deals with, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, getting patents. So I had the opportunity to apply for a patent once. Actually, in fact, I even worked also in a patent attorney's um, office, but um, basically because it's a very legal kind of thing, um, when you apply for a patent, you actually, um, uh, you can't really write it yourself. It's basically impossible because it's, it's a bit like, you know, asking us, asking you to just like, you know, um, defend yourself in a, in a court of law, right? You basically can't do it because you don't know the law and uh, you don't basically know all the rules and you basically need to uh, be, um, you know, kind of uh, very, uh, you know, educated in, in that kind of area in order just to talk the same language. So it's not just a bit about being right, but it's also about just um, having corresponding training and uh, the ability to know these things. So patents are based very similar things. So even if you're, you know, a brilliant scientist, whatever, you get this great invention. If you um, don't know how to write a patent uh, application, then um, you will probably uh, not get your patent through and furthermore probably the patent will be useless because you didn't write it in the way that um, is kind of uh, useful because ultimately this is a legal document to um, you know protect your sort of intellectual property and things like this right so uh, there's a lot of legalese and um, so yeah so he, he was working patent attorney so yeah I also did some kind of similar job at some point too um, but uh, yeah, but um, you know, it's, it's kind of an area. Maybe if you know some science, you sort of end up with. Right? Um, and basically, this guy kind of went and invented uh, this kind of device. Um, and um, sort of a bit of a quote here uh, from a person that is talking about how uh, this was invented. So, so he's talking about electrophotography. And he's saying this had practically no foundation in previous scientific work. Chet, so this guy, put together a rather uh, odd lot of phenomena, each of which was obscure in itself and none of which had previously been related in anyone's thinking. The result was the biggest thing in imaging since the coming of photography itself. So basically, you know, this is a, a way of, of kind of doing photography, but it's uh, extremely um, kind of dif different to uh, the way photography works, which is, of course, you know, you have a camera, you have film. Well, I'm talking about the original kind of ways of doing photography. Um, and, uh, and I guess the main difference here is that in photography, you know, the old fashioned photography, not digital photography, um, you have a photographic, you, know, you have the film, and then there's this process where you develop the film, right? So you develop the film. Uh, and this is a, you know, chemical process where it's often done in a wet kind of situation, right? You have a film and, you know, if you've ever seen movies of people developing film, then, you know, you, you, you basically put your film in this photographic fluid and then develop it and then finally eventually get your photograph but um uh you know so there's a kind of a slow process you know in the olden days <laughs> you had to take your film to the film shop and then you get your pictures back a week later right and you know so um this is this was a way to kind of bypass all that and just like basically get your final image like straight away and so you know it's kind of um you know particularly revolutionary in the context of uh, well uh, regular photography which you know took like a week to get your photos back right so um he's saying he did it entirely without the help of a favorable scientific climate i guess uh like he, yeah so um i guess he, he was doing this in the i suppose in the uh, Graduating 1930. So, yeah, so 1930s, I suppose uh, this is 
sort of Great Depression, sort of a bit after that. So I suppose they're talking about that. And there are dozens of instances of simultaneous discovery through scientific history, but no one came anywhere near being simultaneous with shit. I was amazed by the discovery now as uh, when I first saw it. So uh, this is like the first picture of the photocopy machine, uh, photocopy machine that he invented. So this is the thing that he um, first tested it on. Um, might be nice to just uh, watch a little video of him just doing a bio, just a little bio clip here. So let's just have a look at that. Um, I mean, we will sort of go through that a little bit more, but anyway, I think it's nice just to sort of get a sense of the time and, um, you know, the context of, uh, you know, when this kind of thing was made, right? Okay, so, all right, so that's the guy. Um, yeah, so, uh, um, yeah, so may maybe we can come back to the explanation of that, but uh, so, uh, so one of the key components is we just sort of the, the video, oh, am I uh, sharing the right screen? Yeah, so that's fine. Okay, yeah. One of the key components of photocopier is this uh, so-called uh, photoconductor, right? And um, so this is, uh, yeah, it's kind of a, um, you know, it's not a, not a very common effect, but uh, it can happen in sort of particular materials like uh, selenium. So basically what, what can happen is that if you have a, uh, this photoconductive material, then if you shine light upon it, then if you have charges that are on the surface like this, so originally you say this, there's a charged surface at the, the top and the bottom, then um, uh, when, without the light, it is basically an insulator, right? So if it's an insulator, these charges cannot move. And basically these charges will stay where they are, right? But as soon as you shine light upon it, then this material becomes a conductor. And then when, when you have a conductor, then the charges want to, they can move around as they, as they wish. And because these are charged like this, then they'll sort of come back together and you will not have this uh, charged surface. Right? Um, so, uh, I think we'll come back to why, you know, this kind of material does this type of property maybe later on, um, in the course, but I think at this point, maybe you just think of it like there's just particularly uh, this type of material that has, uh, such, such property. Okay. So, um, so then basically the, the photocopy process sort of, uh, as sort of explained in the, in the video, uh, works a bit like this. So um, say you have this photoconductive material, then initially you've got to put these charges there, right? So you know these charges are not going to just be there without you doing anything. So you've got to sort of charge up this material so that it's got this uh, uh, sprinkling of, of charge on it, right? And so, um, to put the charges there, you have this so-called um, corona wire. And um, we'll talk about this a little bit more in the, in the slides that are coming after this. But basically, it's like some kind of source of uh, electrons. Right? So you have um, basically a high voltage wire. And the high voltage wire is kind of emitting electrons um, Sort of out of it right it's so high voltage that it's sort of uh, the electrons are just coming off the wire right? and by putting the negative charges uh on the surface and then so this is uh in uh, like first it has to be dark right so that the the material is a insulating state and if you put um like a negative set of charges on on the surface here then what that will do it will actually attract a bunch of positive charges from somewhere else because you know uh, basically they're all attracted to the negative charges and these electrons here they can't move. Um, uh, these uh, positive charges come from um, basically uh, some like the ground or something like this. So this other side has a piece of metal on it so that 
like uh, this. Uh, this is like connected to you know so like you know to, to ground so that um. Um, so basically, there can be a flow of these positive charges that um, are attracted to this uh, negatively charged side. Yeah. So, um, so that's sort of like the initial setup. You need to make your uh, negatively charged uh, surface, and then you have this photoconductor. Then, um, then you shine your uh, image onto it. And so this is like that uh, pattern with the date that said uh, Astoria or something um, with the date, right? So uh, you can make a kind of an image where here we're just seeing a cross section, so it's not really an image, but um, but if you shine light just where you want uh, the image to be, then what this will do is that these electrons that where you shine the light now those are free to move, right? So Basically, these electrons here um, now can start moving, and because uh, you know the electrons, they don't want to go this way because there's lots of electrons here. They don't want to go that way. So basically, the only way for them to go is down, and plus there's you know a bunch of positive charges here too. So they all go kind of straight down, and then once they are down there, they kind of neutralize uh, whatever charges there are. So basically, uh, after these charges move, then you'll get like this, um, you know, uh, parts where there are charges and then parts there are no charges. And basically, uh, you know, this is just a cross section, as I say, but, but, uh, you know, when you make a two dimensional image, you'll get basically this sort of charged um, <coughs> pattern of charges. It's like, it's still invisible. You can't see it, see it because, you know, you just, you can't see electrons with your eye, but um, but the electrons will have the pattern of charges um, according to the image that you want to copy. <coughs> then um, you put toner on it, and basically toner is nothing but um, you know it's just like some kind of black dust. Um, and but it, the key point is that they have to be positively charged, so you have to actually charge up this dust. And you want to charge it up so that they're attracted to all the bits where there's the negative charge. Right? So you put it on this side, and the toner is, uh, uh, yeah, gets attracted to, to this part. And then um, uh, you finally get your image that you could actually see. Then um, uh, let's see. So. Uh, Right, right, and then and then the next step is to basically get rid of these uh, excess electrons because now you got the black dust that are in the correct spots, so you don't really need these electrons anymore. So um, you know, uh, we what we're going to do in the next step here is to actually try and transfer this black dust onto the paper. So this this paper. So if we uh, have these electrons here still then you know it wouldn't uh want to go onto the paper uh as well so basically we want to um kind of loosen these this black toner from the surface right and the way you do that is just by shining light everywhere right once you shine light everywhere all the electrons can freely move around and then um you basically don't have these charges and this black toner here is just sort of sitting there just loose right? Uh, finally, uh, basically, you um, press your paper on the surface to transfer the, the black toner uh, onto the paper. And uh, you can make sure that it gets transferred to the paper by, again, charging up this side with a negative uh, charge. And then so it attracts these positively charged toner particles. Um, and then finally, uh, I think this toner is made of such a material that if you heat it up, then it will actually uh, fuse to the paper so that it um, you don't need this uh, negative charge to hold it there anymore. It will just really be uh, stuck to the paper. So, so basically, uh, you know, I mean, th there's you know several steps to this, but you know, essentially, what you're doing here is 
um, first making a kind of an image of the object, but first in, in charges, right? So here you have your image, and it's just made of charge. And then you uh, sprinkle toner on it, which is positively charged, you know, black dust. Um, and then you press that onto the paper somehow, and then you fix it to the paper. So you know, just to simplify the um, explanation there, that's, that's basically what's, uh, what's happening. Um, okay, so that's the basic idea. Um, now maybe let's go back to this video, which uh, I think uh, explains it pretty well in a kind of a more visual way. So let's um, just take a look at that. Let me get rid of this thing. For Make this short and simple. A photocopy machine has following important components a halogen lamp, a photosensitive drum, <coughs> or an ink drum, and a conveyor belt for loading blank papers. So, here's how it works when you place the document you want to be copied upside down on the glass and press the start button, an intense beam of light scans across the document from top to bottom. This light then gets reflected and falls on the photosensitive drum. Now here's where the magic happens. This photosensitive drum is a metal roller which is electrostatically charged by a high voltage wire called a corona wire. This metal drum is coated with a photosensitive chemical called selenium. It is a semiconductor, so it has the property to act as an insulator in dark areas and when light falls on it, it conducts electricity. Now have a look at the document we wanted to copy. When a beam of light was scanned across the document, light got reflected from the white areas, whereas printed letters being black did not reflect any light. When this reflected light falls on the photosensitive drum, the areas of the photoconductor, which was exposed to light, becomes conductive and gets discharged, whereas the area of the drum, which was not exposed to light, remains negatively charged. Thus, we get an electrical shadow of the page on the photosensitive drum. Further, as the photosensitive drum rotates, it carries this electrical shadow towards the toner. The toner is a positively charged, so the toner particle sticks to the electrical shadow, which is negatively charged. Thus, an ink of the document is formed on the drum. Then, a black sheet of paper is fed up from the hopper. As it moves along, the paper is given a strong electrical charge. Thus, the toner image is transferred from the surface of the drum onto a piece paper then passes through two hot rollers. The heat and pressure from the rollers permanently fuses the toner particles on the paper. Thanks to these rollers, the final copy feels so warm and soothing. So there you go. Now you know how a photocopy machine works. Okay, so I mean, I think that's uh, it's nice to see sort of a more visual kind of way to explain it. So. So does that make sense to everybody? Um, any any questions at this point? No. Okay. All right. Um, right. So that's you know that's the basic principle. You know that's I guess the most important part of the photocopier. But um, there are a couple of things which were uh, not uh, you know maybe completely explained so um so in particular so yes yeah, so this this photoconductor you know we might come back to that you know what why it's uh why does it have this property that it conducts when it um when it's light and then insulate when it's dark we will we, we'll come back to that but another thing that we didn't really uh completely or glossed over is this um uh so-called corona wire, right? So we were talking about this corona wire. So we were saying this is something that uh, creates negative charge, right? Okay, so sounds a little bit mysterious. Um, you know, what, what actually is that? Well, um, uh, who's seen one of these uh, um, plasma balls before? Have you seen, anybody seen one of these? Okay, <laughs> I see a couple of, well, no, I see one one person with a tick. So um, 
these are they're usually kind of novelty items right so they're kind of like lamps they're about usually about this big or so and when you turn it on you see this kind of very sci-fi looking kind of you know glow where um these sort of filaments are going out from the middle and they sort of like move around and it's like you know uh, you know quite um striking colors so this one's purple but you can get them in all different kind of colors and um this actually has the same basic uh effect as this uh corona wire but um it's a little bit uh you know, a little bit more easy easy to uh, visualize so um what we're going to do uh this point is to just look at this now um very unfortunately because we're on lockdown uh, normally i would do this part as a kind of a demo so um this is uh, one of the things which i prepared for the course fortunately it's just sitting there in my office and we can't get there so so unfortunately we're going to have to do our best with um i'll just uh, show you a couple of videos again that um have uh you know should give you the basic idea um you know it would, it would have been nice to do this as a demo not just because you know i mean you see it in real life but um you know i uh, i usually get uh, you guys to actually do the experiment actually right Okay, but uh, you know, uh, such as uh, such as our situation now. So, all right. So, what actually is this thing? Well, okay, hold on. Let, let's just uh, let me just show you because perhaps some of you haven't really seen this uh, exactly before. So, let me just show you more or less like what this kind of thing looks like. So. Uh, looks kind of like this so um yeah it's it's got this bulb here this is a quite a small one right and um and so what you can see is that this guy is uh kind of touching uh the side of it and when you touch the side actually there's like a strong filament that goes from the middle to to the edges right and what he's doing now is um so he's touching it and I think this is a yeah. This is this is a um, electrical. Uh, sorry, sorry, this is just the audio plug, right? Plugged into his iPhone, right? And then so uh, by him touching it, uh, it's making all these sounds um, through the speaker of the iPhone. But normally, this thing doesn't make. Uh, any kind of sound really on its own but then if you hook it up to a speaker it will uh, start to make it sound okay so right well let's see if there's anything else that he does here right stuff like this yeah okay so you can touch it with your fingers um and so forth okay so i think that might give you a bit of an idea of uh what what this thing is um so uh um so what what is this thing or does anybody know what you know what this thing is uh how does it work any ideas at this point Okay, no, no, no takers. All right, so, uh, well, that's good because otherwise uh, you should be teaching the course, I guess. Um, so uh, basically what this thing is, is, um, so firstly, so what's, what's inside this globe? Um, well, whoops. Uh, so inside this globe is actually, it's usually filled with some kind of gas, um, maybe like neon, argon, xenon. Uh, these are uh, noble gases, right? And these are also gases that you that are often used for, you know, like these neon lights. Right? So similar types of gases are put inside this globe, and um, 
in the middle is what's called the Tesla coil. And we're actually going to talk about Tesla coils a little bit later in this, in this course too, I think in the next chapter. Um, but basically at this point, all I want you to kind of understand at this point is that a Tesla coil is just basically something that um, uh, creates a, a extremely high voltage um, AC, AC, um, well, current, right? So this thing, uh, you know, you, you plug it into the wall. So um, I, I think uh, for this type of thing, you need, um, you need, a, you know, something that's powered by the wall, uh, you know, and so it boosts up the wall voltage, which is like 200 volts AC. And it boosts it up to 2000 or 5000 volts uh, AC. And I think the frequency is also much, much higher, if I recall correctly. So um, the, the power that comes out of your wall is just uh, something like 50 hertz. But um, uh, I can't quite remember the frequencies, but I, I believe it's much, much higher in this uh, Tesla coil. Um, and so basically what this thing is actually, it's a kind of a combination of this Tesla coil, which is this very high voltage AC current source um, together inside a uh, globe, which is filled with some kind of gas like uh, neon. Oil. So this thing was invented by Nikola Tesla. Um, so Nikola Tesla is, uh, have you all heard of Nikola Tesla? Hmm. Well, I guess you'd know it from the car company, I suppose, yes. So uh, kind of interesting that Tesla has become so famous in recent years. Um, so actually, probably when I was a student, um, I heard of Tesla. I mean, Tesla's, uh, you know, this is the unit of um, how you measure magnetic fields, right? So it's, when you measure magnetic fields, one of the units is uh, Tesla. So, uh, you know, as a physicist, of course, you would have heard of Tesla. But um, I think just somehow, you know, in the last 20 years, everybody decided that Tesla is a, is a super genius. And um, actually, before 20 years, um, I'm not sure if uh, everybody would have necessarily uh, put Tesla at one of the, you know, really high ranking, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, scientists and things like that. I mean, definitely is, you know, very famous, but um, now, you know, kind of the perception is that he's like, he's like another Einstein or something like this, right? But um, it's interesting how it's just, how, uh, times change and then, you know, sort of things go in and out of fashion, but um, it might, might may very well be part of, um, uh, you know, the effect of um, Tesla, the car company too. Okay, so, so um, how does, what, what, why am I talking about this uh, plasma coil? So basically, you know, uh, Let's try and understand a little bit of, of what's really going on here. And so I've already showed you that video. Um, another kind of very interesting effect that this thing does is uh, uh, there's another one. So, and if you touch it, so check this out. Isn't it even much better in the complete darkness? So I got here, light bulb right here, and boom, it turns on. Let's see how far away will it turn on. Boom, this is like a freaking sword. Boom, and the interesting thing, it turns off right next to my hand. Hmm, let's grab it shorter. You see, it turns off next to my hand. All right, let's turn the light on, let's see. You see, it turns off right next to my hand. Let's go up a shorter. You see this one off, this one on. Now let's go up it actually a lot longer. Let's go up it by the end. Right, so, you know, this is another kind of very interesting effect because um, it, uh, you know, this uh, fluorescent light is not connected to anything, right? But normally you think uh, in order to have uh, light, you need to connect your 
power supply to it, but somehow, you know, we're actually generating light without uh, actually even connecting any power source to it. So actually this was one of uh, Tesla's um, grand uh, dreams actually. So he wanted to uh, do, you know, wireless electrical energy transfer. So instead of, you know, our modern day system where we've got like, um, you know, wires connecting to every single home, he wanted to send that energy basically wirelessly. Right? And so this is why he was working on stuff like this. Uh, in the end, I think uh, that was not, um, you know, a really feasible idea, um, but, uh, but actually um, he was also uh, one of the great proponents of um, basically AC, AC voltages as opposed to DC voltages. And um, this is, uh, you know, of course, what we use today. So, okay, so exactly his dream wasn't quite, quite what happened, but I mean, actually, you know, the fact that we use AC uh, voltages everywhere is um, sort of um, part of his doing. Okay, so let's try and understand what is going on in this, in this plasma ball here. So uh, firstly, you know, the name, um, what, what is a plasma anyway? So uh, we know that of course there's, you know, three states of matter. Generally people say three states of matter. So, you know, solid, liquid, and ice. Um, and of course, you know, this has ultimately got to do with the uh, microscopic structure of the of the atoms, right? So in a solid, basically you have a very, um, you know, rigid kind of structure where all the atoms are um, kind of fixed in place. You know, in a liquid, you have the atoms that are freely moving, but they're quite close to each other. And in a, in a gas, they're quite far apart, actually, and they're just bouncing around. Now, um, <clears throat> so uh, in a way, for if you're just talking about atoms or molecules that are intact, then those are the only kind of states of matter. But um, if you also consider the fact that it's possible for the atom to actually break apart and, um, and you can have uh, maybe a mixture of electrons and uh, say positively charged ions, in this situation where these electrons and the positively charged ions are free to move around, um, obviously this needs to be quite a high energy state because of course what, you know, if you, if you have a low energy state then the electron will just sort of recombine with the, with the positively charged ions and that's a more stable state. But, um, you know, in a very high energy state, you can have this situation where, you know, atoms have so much energy that the positively charged ions and electrons are just all just like a kind of a soup of this stuff. And, um, and uh, the, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of, um, you know, in this, in this state where you have all the underlying particles here are all kind of charged. In fact, um, you know, this is what is uh, happening in our sun. Um, you basically, the temperatures are so high that it's actually um, the atoms themselves are sort of uh, breaking down. And in fact, in the example that we've already talked about, when an electrical breakdown occurs and, um, and when we have that spark, actually this is uh, the atoms inside that spark are actually uh, a plasma. Right? So um, it's a kind of an ionized gas, if you, if you want to say it in one word. Um, so how, how do we create this um, kind of plasma state in the first place? Well, it's a little bit already like what I kind of um, discussed before with how the electrical breakdown occurs. So uh, if you have a, uh, a negatively charged uh, uh, potential here, then this can produce uh, electrons and the, this electrons can sort of collide into atoms. And then if they collide with the atoms uh, with sufficient energy, then what can happen is that they, these atoms can further eject more electrons. And uh, 
um, now you've basically got like two electrons which can go and collide with something. And uh, usually there's also another terminal here, which is say positively charged or at least um, ground, which is zero volts. So all these electrons are kind of desperately trying to get from this side to this side. And so they're kind of going to be colliding with many atoms um, along the way. And so basically this kind of produces more and more um, electrons and positively charged atoms. And then so ultimately you have this kind of uh, soup of electrons and, um, and positively charged ions. Right? So uh, essentially, you know, if you want to view it as like a chemical reaction of sorts, then it's sort of like if we're talking about neon, so this might happen in a um, you know, neon light tube. Uh, then an electron will bump into a neutral neon atom, and then this will produce two electrons and a positively charged uh, neon atom. Okay, okay. so uh, basically, you know, you have this kind of cascade of uh, cascade effect of electrons, and um, oops. so. Um, um right so in the case of the photocopier what uh, we actually want to do is to make uh, plasma but uh, we want to actually do that in air so essentially what we're doing is is, is kind of making a, a, a spark right because as i said spark is a kind of a plasma but we want to kind of do it in a, a little bit more controlled way so you know you might imagine like you know, if you're running this corona wire on the surface of this uh, you know, photoconductor, then, you know, you don't want it just sort of sparking everywhere. You, you kind of want an even distribution of these, um, uh, of these electrons, right? So it's, it's sort of like you want this kind of controlled, um, you know, generation of, of plasma uh, in this region. So um, in order to, to make the plasma, you need to actually um, uh, basically exceed this um, uh, threshold of uh, 30,000 volts uh, per centimeter. Uh, I think we uh, already talked about this once in the earlier slides. And so uh, when you have uh, this kind of breakdown, then, you know, the air becomes this kind of plasma and then it can uh, freely conduct uh, electricity. Um, now, uh, you know, does this mean that, you know, we need to really charge up this corona wire here to, to 30,000 volts? So, you know, that sounds like a super high voltage actually to have in a device like, you know, like a photocopier, you know, might be sort of dangerous. And stuff. Um, so uh, one, you know, certainly, you know, if you if you look at this number, it kind of looks like you need to create like thirty thousand volts on on one end of this wire. But uh, but actually, um, if you think about it, uh, you've got thirty thousand volts, but it's it's per centimeter, right? So that actually means that it's thirty. You need thirty thousand volts, like if you have two contacts which are separated by one centimeter. Um, so certainly if you did it like this with like two plates separated by one centimeter, you would need 30,000 volts for this, for this spark to form. But uh, we can actually do, do a little bit better than that actually. And um, to, to sort of understand how we can do a little bit better, then we can think of uh, actually this 30,000 volts per centimeter uh, not really as a voltage, but uh, more like an uh, electric field. So uh, an electric field is basically, uh, it's closely related to that um, Coulomb's law force that, that we talked about uh, earlier on. So if you remember, we had uh, Coulomb's law, which was, um, well, okay, maybe it's easiest just to go back. So hold on. Coulomb's law, we had, uh, yeah, so Coulomb's law uh, back here. Okay, 
okay, here we go. So uh, Coulomb's law, we had, you know, the force between two charges was uh, Q1 times Q2 divided by the uh, distance squared, right? So, and then there was some proportionality constant. So um, electric field is just almost the same thing, except that it's the force per unit charge, um, uh, you know, due to the Coulomb's law. So basically, if you just divide that formula, so same formula, just divide it by Q, which basically turns it into the force per unit charge. And so the way to think of this is that instead of uh, basically saying, okay, I've got one charge here and I've got another charge here, what's the force? Um, you sort of uh, say, all right, well, you know, what if, um, um, you know, I just think of this whole thing as a kind of a, a field that is extending out from some, some point, say. So say you had this charge here and say you consider that charge to be, you know, uh, something out of your control. It's just there. And then, you know, you are moving within this sort of landscape of the field. Then uh, basically then the force that you would experience would be, you know, there'll be a map of the force like this. And you kind of consider this to be the, the you know, the space where you, you potentially can be. And then um, now just the force, the actual force that you feel would simply be whatever this electric field is, and then multiply by whatever charge you, you happen to be. So if you were like two coulombs, then you would multiply the electric field by um, two, and that would be your force. Um, now, if this uh, other charge was a negatively charged uh, charge, then of course it would be all attractive and basically it would be the works the other way. Now, um, uh, the kind of uh, uh, interesting thing about this is that there's uh, kind of two ways to think about the electric field. So you could think of it in terms of like a force per unit charge, that's more or less the definition. It's basically, you know, how much force per charge do you, do you experience? But uh, you can also think of it as a, uh, in terms of a voltage uh, gradient. And basically they're, they're completely equivalent ways of um, thinking about it. So um, this is sort of the rough explanation, but uh, um, uh, so for example, if you uh, wanted to convert your electric field into a voltage, then because uh, uh, energy is like force times distance, right? Work is force times distance. So then we could actually relate the voltage um, to uh, the uh, electric field in this way because uh, electric field is like, you know, force per unit charge. But then if you multiply this by distance, it becomes energy per unit charge. And we already know that that's voltage, right? So actually we can, also think of the electric field as um, as basically electric field is uh, the voltage uh, divided by like the distance. Okay. And so this means that the electric field, the units of the electric field, you can, there's kind of like two common ways to think about it, which is that it's uh, force per charge, that's more or less the definition here, but it's also actually volts per, per meter. So it's actually like how many volts does it change uh, across some distance? So if you, if you move, you know, if you're comparing the, uh, the, the, the voltage from here to here, um, you know, the voltage will change from, from here to here because here it's positively charged, here's negatively charged. And then uh, the electric field is sort of like, how much does the voltage change um, across that distance? So it's voltage over this uh, over this distance. So um, so this is actually kind of useful to think about in terms of um, uh, of this uh, electrical breakdown. So uh, another way to then basically think about the breakdown voltage here of uh, 30,000 volts per centimeter 
um, is that basically it's actually an electric field, right? So um, what actually causes the breakdown is not really, it's better to not think of it as a voltage kind of dependent thing. It's, it's better to actually think of it like, you know, the voltage will break down if you have uh, this much kind of electric field. And um, so this 30,000 volts per centimeter is actually kind of the electric field that you need. And that actually makes sense because, you know, if you have an atom and you, what we're trying to do with electrical breakdown is that you've got an atom and then you're actually trying to like completely break apart the atom. Right? So the electron and the proton is actually needs to go in different directions. And so you need a certain force for that to happen. And, uh, you know, the minimal force that you need for that electrical breakdown to happen is basically this amount of 30,000 volts per centimeter. Okay. All right. So I hope that's clear. Any questions? Nope. Okay. Right. Yeah. So um, then, uh, basically, using that idea, uh, what we can do is to uh, uh, compare, basically, like you know, different shapes of objects and how they actually cause um, this breakdown, um, or you know, how easy it is for things to. Uh, cause electrical breakdown depending on their kind of shape. Okay, so uh, maybe we can just uh, just talk intuitively at this point. So suppose, you know, your hand was charged up to like, you know, 30,000 volts, right? Now, um, uh, if you were to just go and touch this doorknob, which is like connected to the ground, right? so it's basically zero volts, your hand is 30,000. Right? Now, uh, you know, this is enough for a spark to 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 sort of um, well uh, jump between your hand and door. But uh, you could also have, if you're carrying like a small pin here, then um, a spark might also happen. Now, just intuitively, which one do you think would be you know more more easy for this? Uh, Kind of spark to to occur. The second one, because there is a, a bigger uh, distance between the uh, the voltage. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So just kind of intuitively, uh, the, you know, the sharper object probably. You'd, Sort of expect to have um, a spark, uh, you know, to form much more easily. And the the way we can sort of understand that in a more, um, you know, quantitative way is that so basically this, you know, breakdown voltage is so it's thirty thousand volts per per centimeter, right? So this is the breakdown voltage is um, thirty k. 30k volts uh, per centimeter. Right? So basically, in this case, in the case of the hand, where um, so the voltage in your hand is 30,000 volts on door is zero. So essentially, when this distance becomes one centimeter, then then a spark's going to happen. Right? Spark is going to happen. Longer than that, then uh, you know, the, the voltage, um, um, well, the voltage difference is the same. It's always 30,000, but, but uh, because the distance is longer, uh, this, this gradient actually, so it's actually more got to do with the slope of, of, this, of this gradient rather than the actual amount. So uh, essentially what this, this thing is saying is that when this, this slope is getting like more 
uh, steeper than 30,000, then uh, this spark is going to happen. So you can kind of see that in this second example, that um, uh, uh, like because of the way that this thing is shaped, actually the uh, voltage will actually go down with a sort of a different dependence, right? And uh, because it's kind of a pointier shape, this thing will actually the electric uh, the, the voltage will actually sort of drop faster. And then, and then level off later. And you know, I mean, to work out exactly that dependence, you need to sort of you know, do some calculations. But at this point, you have to sort of take my word for it um, that um, for a pointy object, basically, the voltage will sort of drop faster. And so basically, here you're going to actually, you know, this is much steeper at this point here, right? Because it, it goes down faster. So actually, even though this is, uh, you know, this could be further away, a, a spark will actually happen uh, much more easily uh, because of the of the shape of this object. So I don't know. You might like to try that on a winter day, where you, instead of uh, touching somebody, you get a you get a pin, and then you walk around with the pin, and then you know, trying to make sparks. Well, okay. Um, okay, actually, maybe, maybe we should um, leave it there and then take up the rest next. Uh, let me just see what's on the next slide. Yeah, okay. All right. I, I think we can, we can leave it there and um, continue there. So but any, any questions or anything today? Okay, no, then good. Uh, as for the homework, uh, I think homework will be same as usual. So please just summarize what we've learned in today's lecture, hand it into Brightspace. And um, otherwise I will see you next week. Okay. Bye everyone. Bye-bye. Sorry, there was a chat question. Okay.